There you go. Ah. Okay, that's good enough. So, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming. It's week 10. And it's week 10. We're going to try this as fast as possible. So, lecture four, we're going to do some state machines. So, since it's week 10, we don't have much of uh, anything for announcements. We do have our fall course survey. Please fill that out. That's nine. <laughs> um, we do have our fall uh, course survey. Please fill it out. That's going to be able to let us know what's working and what's not. So, what did we learn in lab three? We can't trigger sensitivity lists on both the positive edge and the negative edge of our clocks. Uh, and that can't be synthesizable into Verilog. You have to change the RAM parameters in order for it to work for what we're working with. That's why we taught you guys parameters in lab two. Parameters end up being very, very useful coming forward. Uh, please make sure you understand them and use them properly. If you guys have any hesitancies about RAM, or Parameters, please let us know uh, either by PM or by just uh, asking questions right now. And then RAMs versus registers. Uh, I know a lot of people have not taken CS33 or any of those sort of courses, and uh, we didn't really teach it last lecture. So RAM is actually a completely separate chip from the FPGA, and in order for it to communicate with the FPGA, it takes time. The trade-off between that and registers, which are on that PGA, is that you actually uh, can store more data on the RAM chip. Uh, Pinplane is annoying. Thank you, Toby, uh, who isn't here right now, unfortunately, um, for making that Excel sheet. It's very, very useful. All right, next slide. Okay, so today we're going to go to state machines. Um, if you take an M16, you probably covered these, but we're going to look at how to do it in Verilog, how it's useful for us. You don't really use these in DAP, but it's, it's good to know for um, just general like, digital logic design and computer architecture. So let's get into it. Um, <laughs> yeah, in our overview, as I said, we don't use it in DAP, so we're going to be going over there to do same machines. But this is this will be useful if you interview for FPGAs and stuff, so trust. Um, also, lab is pretty fun. I made it myself. Um, just more timeline stuff. We're here. Almost done fall quarter. So. A little bit of review. Would you like to take us through, Andrew? Yeah, so we're going to go ahead and give a second look at sequential logic. Uh, sequential logic is really important for uh, uh, state machines and uh, just going forward. So, you have your registers and your gates and your wires. Uh, memory is stored in your registers. That's how or you have memory capabilities with registers. Um, it also allows you to have sort of delays using clock patterns. You can think of a combination of sequential logic such as a combination lock or a padlock with the little twisties. Uh, courtesy of Sedan from last year on the state machines. State Oh, yeah, this yeah. is yours. Okay, yeah, so, so state machines are actually very very useful, very versatile. Um, we can just have like a random example here. But uh, basically, we're talking about finite state machines, so we use an acronym called FSM. We'll use the rest of the lecture, and that just means that our, our, our machine, right, it has a finite number of states that it can be in. And this just helps us keep track of like, different inputs and outputs that are possible whenever our machine is doing is like in a certain part of a task or, or a program or something like that. So at every stage, you use, you use the input that the, the machine is seeing to calculate your next output or your next state or even an output. And it's basically just a way to react differently to what, to what your environment is giving you uh, based on what, what you're like currently at. So moving forward. Um, this is the hardware representation that you see in the picture. So you have your inputs coming in, and those will help calculate your next state. And then what happens is that every clock tick, your uh, register that or a few registers that represent your state will actually update with the with the from with the logic that's telling you what your next state is. And from the state that you're currently in, your machine will know what to output. So you'll see this more in the examples we provide. But this is really useful because if you're always keeping track of a state, it helps to like perform tasks where you're, you're going to want to like keep track of what you've already done or where you're currently at. Maybe there's like stages of something that you need to complete to get to a final output, um, which whereas 
otherwise you have to just like keep a register that just you're just like randomly checking every time to see if like you reached your output and maybe you can't like keep tracking a, like a process that you stepped through or something like that. So in this it's important to know that the logic for decoding the next state and the logic for decoding <coughs> outputs are both combinational. So those are always running, but you're only updating sequentially what state you're in. So the clock tick only affects your logic in the um, in the sequential part, which is the flip flop representing your state. So we'll get we'll get to this in the code too, but just keep that in mind that this middle part is sequential, and then these blocks are combinational. All right. So now we're going to move on to Mealy and Moore state machines. Mealy state machines depend on both the state and the input that is provided to the state machine, uh, whereas Moore state machines are only dependent on the state. You'll see further examples when we go uh, later in the lecture where we'll actually distinguish between Mealy and Moore machines. Moving on, we got state graphs. Yeah, so you saw an example state graph in the first state machine slide, which was just like a random like, video game character. But this is, this is just a random state graph. Um, but essentially, you, this is just to show that you can visualize your state machine in all the states with, all the, uh, with, with arrows for the transitions between the states. So here, like in state A, so here uh, the slash is just separate, is not in the division, it's just separating um, the state name from the output at each state. So our output is Z, and our state labels are A, B, and C. And you can see that, like to go from state A to B, you need your input W to be one. And then once you reach state B, if your input W is still one, then it'll move to state C. And that's when your output is Z, uh, Z is one. So like this kind of random example, we'll go into more like less abstract examples soon. But um, this is just a good way to represent states. And this is useful because um, you, if you design your state machine like this, it's really easy to visualize, right? If you do it all in code, you might mess some things up. But if you do it all in a, in a, gra in a graph like this, you can see where all your inputs are going in, uh, what outputs are at each stage. Um, and you keep track of all your states. And maybe you'll know, like, I need to add one more state. It's super easy. You just add another state in, and you like redraw the connections. And you can actually do this with a tool called FISM, which um, some of you might have done now. Uh, one or M16, but we're not going to teach FISM, but if you just click through, if you just literally load it up, you can just see, like, it'll let you, like, add states, add connections, it's really easy to use, um, and if you want, you can even try it for the lab. Um, you can draw something out like this, and the cool part of FISM is that it lets you convert to Verilog code, so we'll talk about, like, the general format of, Verilog code, of the Verilog code for state machine later, but if you're confused at all, you can literally just Put this in FISM, create your states, you can like rename your inputs and outputs to whatever we use in the lab, like the pin names and stuff, and then it'll literally create the Verilog code for you that does the state machine on logic. So, a little exercise right now. Uh, what type of state machine is this? Is this Mealy or more? Uh, more machine? It's a more machine, that's right, because why? Uh, it only depends, the output only depends on the uh, current state. That's correct, yes. So if you had something, for example, like W or Z, that would be a, a Mealy machine since it also depends on the input from W. That may seem like a useless distinction right now, but when you imp when you create your own state machines, you should keep track of whether you're using your, you're like making it Mealy or more because if you mix between and sometimes you're like using your state to output something and sometimes you're using your input to output something, it'll get confusing. But if you always, it's really simple to make a more machine because if you always know what state you're in, you always know what your output is. And if it's mealy, then you'll have to keep track of like what state you're in and what input you're taking. So just keep that in mind when you design your own um, FSMs. Now onto this checkpoint. So, another question. Where is the state stored on this circuit that we have from our previous lectures? The flip flop, that's right. And so, <coughs> what is handling the next state logic? Remember, next state logic is purely combinational. The adder. That's right, the adder. And finally, what's our output? This is what we had from lab two, so this should be an easy question. Bradley? The count. 
the county. That's right. Awesome. Great job, guys. Now we're going to move on to some examples. Uh, this is going to be some of the basics of state machines, going from like the very, very basic up to uh, some of the more difficult stuff. So first, we're going to start with that uh, or that sequential lock right here. So the sequential lock works by having, say, digit one, three, and five are our digits that we use to unlock our, or the code that we have to unlock our lock. So we start with a uh, lock. We start with our initial lock state, and then if we have one as our first digit. Then we move on to a next one digit state, then three, and then we get to our second digit, then five, then we can finally unlock our lock, right? If you don't have five, one, three, and five in that order, it'll reset back to the locked state. So that's just like how you'd have for something like this sequential lock. Um, does anyone know what type of state machine this is? It starts with an M. <laughs> <laughs> Does it depend on the inputs? I guess, what, well, first of all, the output we're getting at here is whether it's locked or unlocked. So, like, at, so is that based on just a state or based on the input at a state? Okay, well, that's 11. Four. It's a more machine, that's right. It, that's because it doesn't depend on the input. It only depends on the state position. Alrighty, on to our next uh, example with the traffic light. Yeah, so this is just like, you can just think of a traffic light as being, I mean, the three states would just be whether it's green, yellow, or red. But this is more of a meme slide, but <laughs> that is more based on like how a traffic light controller would work if um, based on how much traffic there is. So I think the general idea is like if you see traffic on like the academic avenue, then you know you want to turn the lights for that green and turn the other ones red, and then say vice versa for uh, Rovado Boulevard. But um, it, this is just showing that like you can use an FSM in a lot of like, real life situations that you generally like you might not have a foundation of like what to code to control this, but if you just think of it in a state machine. Is generally a good way to go about it, at least uh, like fundamental problems. All right, and on to our slightly more complicated, complicated example, the vending machine. This one actually depends on two inputs. There's the money, and there's also the buttons. So, depending on how much money you insert right here, it will move to this uh, this state where it counts the counts the coins. Right? If there's finally enough coins, you can have the selection of two buttons. Whereas you have the soda or the reject uh, reject coins button, right? And then finally, it brings it to the dispense after you've selected uh, which soda you want. Um, that's pretty much it. Um, any questions about this one? Yeah, these are all just we're not gonna actually make any of these, but it's just examples to put like the abstract concept of a state machine to you know real life things you've seen. But now we're gonna get into some niche ones. Got a zero communication one for you. So this one's UART. So if you ever want to control your RGB keyboard or whatever, uh, it usually uses UART uh, protocol. Um, so this is our state machine. Sorry, I was trying to think of what UART stood for. I forgot. <laughs> um, universal asynchronous. Retrieve. Transfer. Retrieve. No, no, it's retrieve. Oh, R. Yeah, yeah. Have that. So essentially, we start our state machine here, and then uh, when we get the negative edge of our start bit, we go to here, where we then, uh, I'm sorry, it starts here. When we get the negative edge to our start bit, we go to our start state, where then we move on to collecting our data and then checking our checksum. If this doesn't make sense to you guys, uh, that's all right. Uh, you've got to read into UART protocol itself, and then it'll make a lot more sense. But this is really cool because this is how it's actually implemented in, uh, in all the UART controllers that you have on your devices. So on that iPhone that you're using right there, that's, uh, <laughs> that uses UART when you charge it and when you transfer data to your computer. Okay, and then even uh, more kind of like technical here. So in, the, in M151B, you'll like cover computer architecture uh, and then memory accessing. 
And a way that you can actually organize like memory is by having multiple caches that talk on like a single cache um, like communication line. And so what every cache has to do is like once it gets like a, a value from like deep disk memory, right? It stores it in a cache, but there's like four caches that four different processes are using. And what happens is that if this cache has a value, then it can like use these states to tell other other uh, processors if they already has a value there. So like this is it's complex once you once you learn it, but it's cool to know that like you can use an FSM. Like computers use FSMs in like small small parts of their processing power, um, because like since we're doing digital logic design, a lot of the computer architecture courses you take or maybe internships you get will actually use digital design concepts. And this is like a good example of that where some person probably just thought of this and was like, oh, if we just have three states, um, this actually stores like two, uh, two bits to store four states, but it's three it's three state system. And you can communicate based on like well, whether you have the, the value. And it's saying like, if this, ca if this processor changes this value and wants to write it back and everyone should see it, then it has to switch to this state that's called M. Because it's saying it just modified the value. And then as soon as someone writes, the rest of them have to be invalidated because that means their updated copy is, is is wrong now, right? Because this processor just changed the value. So like, um, once when you cover this, you'll be able to see that it, it's just nice how FSMs are implemented everywhere. Yes. Um, and then more into computer architecture. This is even more tangential than that, but I think it's cool. So controller and data path are it's, it's, this, it's this way of setting up our, so a controller is going to be an FSM that takes signals and controls like the values that you get from your data path, and data path is going to be this thing that's fully combinational, so we move next slide. So you can see here, our data path, this is going to be a basic data path, um, basically it can take input data and give you output data, but it'll also feed data to the state machine that actually controls like what you want to do with your data. So you can always have data running. Um, and that's the cool thing about Datapath, right? Because when we're doing uh, circuit level hardware, all of our computations are running all the time. But sometimes you don't want to use all of your computations, or you might want to change one of them. So like maybe in this uh, in this MUX, right? You can change like what whether you take just the input or you take like the input with something added on like that. Um, and that's all controlled by an FSM on top. So th this is just like kind of a concept is that you can have a controller and a Datapath to split your project between just computation and control. We go to the next slide. It actually goes into, so this is how a basic uh, processor is kind of built. This is a slide taken straight from my 152MB. And um, how this works is everything in blue is actually the controller. And so that's the same machine that controls like um, what, so the ALU arithmetic logic unit, which I think we build later in the, in the winter quarter, but um, an ALU has multiple operations that can do like add, subtract, multiply, and like bit shifting or other stuff like that. And you can pick, the controller will pick like which operation it wants so that the data path, even though it's an ALU, it has multiple different things you can do through the data path. So you have to control what you want the data path to do for you. Otherwise, you need 10 different things instead of just one ALU, right? Because you need all 10 things, and then it do this basically the same thing where you just have to mux the data. But that, I mean, that's basically what an ALU is. But you need the controller to tell you what the actual like valid output should be. So in a, in a CPU, you actually get an instruction at every step, and your controller like takes that info and tells the rest of all the computational hardware like what it should do with that instruction. So that's like, that's like the utility of having an FSM where you can abstract away like all the computational stuff and just do the high-level control of what you want to get out from each instruction. If this looks scary, that's all right. It looks scary to me first, uh, but it just takes a bit of looking at and uh, you'll get the idea. You really just got to focus on uh, the blue part and the separation between the blue section and the black section in order to understand what uh, we're trying to get. All right, on to our next checkpoint. Do you want to take this one over? Okay. So since all the data path control stuff is a little abstract, we're going to try to simplify here. So we're back to the base scatter. I want to ask you, what do you think the data path is in this example? This is kind of a trick question because at least data path wise, so data path is just anything that does combinational um, computations. So 
that part should be easy. The controller will uh, not worry about it. What, what's doing just straight combination with computation here? Like the IR? Yeah. So not going to be considered a data path because you're just taking the input data and getting output data from it, right? Um, and then we're not really doing control here, so it's kind of misleading. Um, that's my thought. But if, what you could do with this adder, like I think maybe in the stopwatch, since we had the adder adding up like over and over, the controller could have been like maybe a state that says you want to reset back to zero. That's like a type state. But see um, the we'll skip the division of labor part. But in this, this is the one place where we're using a state. It's kind of uh, would be kind of like pointless because so. Same machines are useful, but also sometimes you can have way too many states. So in this case, if we use this, if we did this as a state machine, how many states would we have? Like an adder, that's a state machine. So every count would have to be like a new output at a new state. So say that there was a, go ahead. And if like two of the time are part of any that counted? Yeah. Uh, that would be the correct answer. Good job. Yeah. So like, if we did this as an FSM, I just might have said you need two to the power of many bits to have a state count. And so, when you implement FSMs, they're usually useful. But you should take a, a moment to think about like, could you could you do it with just just a data path? Because like this is just kind of just a computational function. Uh, you don't need to fit an FSM in there. Um, okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this stuff you can kind of just read through if you're interested in retaining it. This is like an M51B concept, but if you have a pipeline for your processor, you have to think about this thing called a critical path, which will, like, basically, it's the longest part of your data path that you have to get through to compute something. And so you usually want a pipeline by splitting up that large section and then balancing out everything else so that every pipeline stage, every pipeline stage has to be around the same amount of time. And has to be like the minimum you can possibly get. Um, how this relates to an FSM, honestly, you don't have to really worry about it. <laughs> Alrighty, now on to our actual Verilog stuff. This is the fun part. So, we're going to be using this as our example. Uh, this right here is going to be our state machine diagram. And uh, we're just going to be calling this a simple acceptor. So. Uh, we are start at idle, and then if we get the combination 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, then we get to this right here, where we will then output 1. And any other point, we will then, res any other incorrect uh, part of this acceptor, we will then reset back to our idle state, where we would then wait for 0, 1, 1, 1, 0 again. All right, so now we're going to implement this in Verilog. First, we've got to do a bit of setup. So this right here is just uh, our setup code, where we have our parameters, which are going to be defining what our state names are. So here we have SD idle, S so this is ST idle, state idle, state zero, state zero one, state zero one one, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And once you get to this, that would be your final state. Then we also have these two registers, where it notates current state and next state. Um, that's going to be useful to store which state we are on and which state we're going to be going to on our next clock cycle. And then uh, this all up here is just our clock, our reset, our input, and then our output, uh, which we're going to uh, set at our set to one at this at this state. Talk about why it's a parameter resource. Well, the reason why we want parameters is because that's essentially like a constant in Verilog, and you can't change them. Which is very important that you just don't go changing the, your states. You want to change between your states, but not the states themselves. Um, so that's so in order to keep it uh, a constant, we use parameters, and that makes that a lot easier. So then in our always block, we're going to be having always at our pause edge of our clock. If we're not resetting, if we don't press the reset button on our FPGA, we then move on from our from our next state to our current state, or I'm sorry, we then put our current state to our next state, and then that is pretty much it. This right here is our next state logic. This is all combinational. 
it computes the next state based off of uh, what the input data is and what your current state is as well. So for example, this would be our state zero. If it's next state would be, if we're a current state, and current state is st idle, and we see data is one, then we get st idle. So that means that we, oh well, this is inverse of data. So then it would be go to state of zero. So then we go to next state. Does that make sense? That's a bit of a bad explanation. So uh, let me know if you guys have any questions. No six right there. I think. I think yeah. So in the state diagram, you might there was an arrow that points back from idle back to idle, and it was if your input is one, and that's what this is showing. So so there you can see that in idle, the one points back to itself. So one is your input, and your state is idle, right? So it's saying if you're in the idle state. They're going to compute your next state as idle if you're getting a, if data is a one. So that's your loopback transition. And I think the other transition is if, if you get a zero in, then you want to go to state zero because in the in the diagram, if you uh, if you go back in the diagram, um, uh, wrong diagram. No. Yeah. So if you go uh, yeah, if you go back to the diagram, you can see that in idle, if you get a zero, it goes to state zero. So that's what this next state logic is computing. It's computing the next state you want based on what input you're getting. Does that make sense? All right. A bit better of an explanation. Thank you. OK, I guess going along with that, um, we said that both these parts are combinational, where the left side, the decoding the next state, and decoding the outputs are both combinational. So you also want to do this combinational logic here, which this output logic is going to be based on what your FSM is, right? In this FSM, all it's saying is that once you're in the state, I think it's like 0, 1, 1, 1 or something like that. Yeah. If your current state is, sorry, if your current state is 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, then you want to assign your output as valid. Because that's the only state in which we know that our output is valid and we return a 1. I think that was in the diagram. That's the only state that returns a 1. Because, because that means we accepted the right input. So in any other state, we want to return a 0 because we know we haven't accepted the correct input. So this. Um, it's just going to be based on like what you want your. This is just you're purely basing your output. If this was mealy, you'd base this. This output logic would also be based on what your input is. So that's what it says here is like if it cared where your next data point is, um, data input is, that that would be included in the logic. But since our implementation is currently more, it's just going to do based on the state. So if you guys notice, the advantage of having a mealy machine is that you actually save yourself one state because instead of transitioning to your uh, to your s your state zero 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 one 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 zero, you just use the input data and you check if that's correct. If that isn't correct here, then you'll actually have to go back to idle anyways um, through a mealy or a more machine, and that's why um, we have it like that. And keep in mind. This is purely combinational once again. So we use an assign because this logic, as soon as the state changes, it's going to be assigning like this output. So it has nothing to do with like it's not updating on a clock edge itself, but because the register that, it, that its input comes from is updating sequentially, that uh, that's why this output will output the correct thing at all times because it'll update on the clock ticks, but only because it's it's like directly wired to the, the sequential output from here to here. Yeah. All right. And with that, oh yeah. So we have our, uh, so we can calculate next state and output separately. That makes it really easy to like visualize. Or you just do the whole thing in one. So I think Andrew actually prefers the method. You said that it's generally used more, right? Uh, I think that's, this is one that's used less. It's just like a couple of less lines of code, but, in, but it does make it a little less readable. But then you don't have to worry about like what next state is because you're just only keeping track of current state, and um, that's really nice for me because I don't like keeping track of multiple things at once. I, my brain doesn't do that. But in the other sense, even if you have to keep track more things, putting next state calculation as purely combinational gives you the opportunity of completely like abstracting the two parts. So like you can make this block that decodes the next state completely separate from your registers that hold the state. Otherwise, if you do both at once, I just circled them both together, you have to make that entire part of your circuit fully sequential. So the logic you're doing for the next state, you have to make sure it's like updating everything perfectly in sync. So you'll just have to track more things. 
or, or in one instead of tracking them separately. Um, okay, so with that, that basically concludes our lecture. But the spec, which we would post after finals, so we'll do your finals properly first. Um, this should be a fun one. You don't have to complete this, but the hope is to create a little alarm clock kind of thing. So you know, you, you pull your phone out, go to like the timer, the clock app or whatever. You need to like set your laundry alarm. Well, now you can do it with your FPGA. So the idea here is that you've already made a stopwatch, a piano, and a seven segment display module. Now what we're gonna do is change these a little bit. So rewire them a little bit, change their functionality a little bit, and wire them all into one module that makes an alarm clock. So a stopwatch counts up, timer counts down. So that should be an easy fix. And then a piano um, plays multiple notes. We only really need one alarm tone, but maybe you want to, you know, want to get kind of frisky with this, and you make it like a plays it like a whole, I don't know, musical escapade. I have no clue. That's up to you. But for me, um, I've just been doing it with one tone. And then our seven second display, you have to change a little bit. Right now we can't display enough. We can't display alphabetical information, right? So you're gonna have to change it a little bit to be able to display um, words too, because like what we're gonna do is that when the alarm, so what we, first what you'll do is you'll have a state where you can like where you're just idle. So your display will show zeros or done or something like that. That means your clock, your alarm isn't set. Then you'll go to state where actually I guess you can go to the next slide. This whole specs here. Um, this is the entire yeah. Style. So Andrew was, Andrew was kind of busy, so I made a spec for you guys. That's all he got. But basically. Well, the set state, um, you go to that once you press your reset button, and this will put you in a state where your display will tell you how much time you want to run your timer for, and then, um, so with the switches, you'll tell it how much time you want to put it for. Uh, I'll probably do it in seconds, and then um, you can do it in minutes, but then I'll have to wait a minute to check you out, so that would be unideal. But um, you set the time you want to run for. And then you press, a, you press the other button, so that's like your continue button or your play button, and that'll run your timer. So that'll run your timer down with your like inverted stopwatch until, and when you're running, it'll just, um, it'll just show the time on your display, right? So when you're in set state, it shows the time you want to set to your uh, alarm, and in the run state, you want to run it down. So that's just going to be running down the clock for you. And as soon as it hits zero, that's what count equals done means, then your buzzer will start buzzing, so basically that's like your piano that you adapted into a, just a buzzer alarm tone, that'll start playing. Um, and there's, a cool tr there's some cool tricks to do that uh, fully combinationally, but that'll be, there is a real spec. I was joking, this is the whole spec. Um, the, the buzzer state will just start beeping and then you'll show like, it'll also flash beep on your display. And then finally, once once you press the button again, the continue button, that'll just stop your timer. That's like I guess not snoozing, but it's like stopping your alarm. So once you do all this, you should be able to have an alarm clock that just that you can just use. Hopefully with a tone that is is annoying enough to wake you up, not annoying enough to annoy anyone else. So um, this is just like this is a draft up of this. I will put out a spec after finals. Um, but yeah, that should be your your same sheet. You can you should be able to create the same sheet in FISM because you can actually re like you can change what your inputs are and stuff and like rewrite them. But also you can just try making the logic yourself without any vision help. Um, but that will be our exclusion to state machines. So you know, a cool challenge over the winter might be to actually implement some extra states in order to make a snooze functionality. Um, it's really only adding like one state and a couple extra arrows and you'd win my heart. So you should do that. All right, I think that's the end of lecture. Thank you guys for coming. We try to keep it as short as possible. So uh, that's pretty much it. Thank you guys. Good luck on finals. Huge thanks for coming. <laughs>